The following presentation is a gift from the team at Streamline Publishing, publishers of Fine Art Connoisseur, Plain Air Magazine, and weekly newsletters Fine Art Today, Realism Today, Plain Air Today, and American Watercolor, and events, the Plain Air Convention and the Figurative Art Convention. We offer over 400 different art instruction tutorials and ultra high quality video by the world's leading artists. If you like what you see, help us support our artists and our team with your purchase. Each video aired has a special discount code for today only in the comments section with a link to the video offered. And to see everything we do, or if you want to receive notice of new releases, new products, and new events for artists, simply click the other link, which says, see everything we do. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes with Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. During this time when we've been showing you videos, we've had so much demand to bring back Bill Davidson. We're bringing you his other video, How to Paint Glowing Landscapes. Enjoy. Hi everybody, I'm Bill Davidson, and we're gonna to talk today about some really inspirational things that'll help you paint and become a master painter. If you follow these steps, you're guaranteed to create masterful paintings. I've studied performance and I read a tremendous amount on what makes people a better performer. I've probably taught over a hundred workshops and I've actually used clinical trials in my workshops to see what made it easier for somebody to paint. Um, so I would set up like a certain painting for everybody to paint, have them do it one way, then have them do it another way and find out the easiest ways within which one would become better at painting quicker, faster, without all the trouble. Um, if you are a master, see, you can avoid a lot of these steps because you already know what to do. But I transferred from being a lawyer, I call myself a recovering lawyer, and I like to start with a joke, but being there's nobody here to laugh, you don't really want to do jokes in the videos. But what happened was I took a lot of workshops and I, that's a great way to learn. There's some great teachers. The interesting thing back then was everybody was going right at the paintings and people weren't breaking it down in the simple steps so that the learners like intermediates and beginners like myself and the, most of us were actually able to follow really well. So by reading about what makes performance great and also by really watching the clinical trials in my workshops, I was able to piece together like a process. It's so much easier to paint and will actually should help you. So as we go through this, I want you to remember, one of the big things is humility. If you can take critiques and actually listen to constructive feedback, you'll end up in a situation where you learn way faster and way quicker. Now when I break down these steps, what we're going to end up doing is painting a really nice sunset painting with a lot of glow because I want you to work through how to build these things up and how to get really glowing magical type paintings. All the latest research now shows that working on your beliefs and hard work and discipline, those things usually fail. The number one thing you need is passion. When I talk to people and they've come back to another workshop after you've been at one of my earlier ones, they'll say, oh yeah, I didn't get to, you know, I haven't painted as much as I should or I could have. Or you talk to older painters that are actually been painting for 35 years, they go, yeah, I'm bored, I haven't got there. So the key for me, I love plein air painting. The key for me when going into the studio is I'm not going to do a lot of it unless I can figure out a way to make it passionate. All the recent studies show. Passion is the key that moves you through everything. So if you want to get excited, this is what's really cool. It's like getting to eat the cherry first. You get to find your passion, develop your passion, and then the rest of it's going to fall in place if you can follow through these steps. 
Now, these are my methods. There are other ways probably out there to do it. The key that you want to start with is staying right there and being excited the whole time. Now, there's something about um, being able to paint from an excited point of view because it does somehow translate into the paintings. And I'm really big on energy, brush stroke, those type things because those are the type paintings I love. So as we go through this, what you're going to answer is two questions. What do you love to paint and how would you love for it to look? Okay, so what we're going to do is, I'm going to show you a step-by-step -step process before we do this painting, just to kind of help you out and get an idea of how, this is the study, and we're going to paint this in an 18 by 24, because repetition is the key to learning, one of the big keys. You won't hear it till you're ready to hear it, and so by seeing it and hearing it over and over and over again, it finally sinks in and you start to get it. Now, first you have to hear it and see it. And that's why I like to talk while I paint. By using both of those, it really helps sink it into you. The problem is you're going to have to hear it an awful lot during your lifetime, and you'll even forget some of it and come back to it. So since I love the plain air paint, and I will always say this, plain air painting, and one of the things about that is you start to get the color harmonies. You can work on design and shapes and things of those type of nature when you get back in the studio and outside, but color harmonies you almost exclusively get from outside. So our subject matter is going to be this little painting or this picture that I took right here up at Polly's Island. Now you'll see that it, the, dis, the view and the glow and those type things are really good. Now I painted this also while I was outside. Um, but this picture here helps show some of the glow and the way some of the things work. What's nice about this is you can see that the cloud design is not great, nor is actually the marsh design. So we're going to go through and look at what I've done with this type of painting. This is actually a 40 by 30 based off that similar scene. Now this painting was a great fun to do, and as you can see, I've redesigned all the clouds and also redesigned the marsh area to make it a better painting with a lot of lead-ins and design. As we go forward, you'll see I have drawn the lines that show your way through the painting. As you look at it, you can see this. As I come in from down below, I slide up in here. Then I've got a focal area that kind of goes like right through this area. As I come in, I go back up, and then I'll come back up and back up this way. Now, as you see, you can see all the directional lines pointing you into the painting and the direction of each cloud and the direction of even these marsh lines as they move you back into the painting. So that's what I mean. Once you learn, most masters have hidden design lines that run you to a focal area. So I took that photo. Now I went to something called Art Set Pro on my iPad. It's, any, it's an app you can get. It's very easy to use. It has paint brushes, everything on it. There's DV, DVDs on YouTube and things of that type of nature that will actually help you. It's very easy to use. You could, in 30 minutes you can learn to use it easily. What I've done is I've taken the 30 by 40 painting and redrawn it and redesigned it for the purpose of the demo that we're going to do here. And I played with it just by getting brush strokes in there and moving designs and moving shapes around to make a different painting. You'll see, once again, these are the directional lines that I'm using to show the direction of the painting. Everything coming in one direction, then kicking back this direction, then going to a focal area, and then this leading me in that way, and this leading me back towards my focal area, right up and through here. Okay. Now, if you pay attention to the lines, it becomes very easy to see how most of the direction works. And you'll see that these lines counter these lines. So the movement kicks you in, kicks you back this way, and down into my focal area. This little area over here leads you back in also. Those type things are what helps if you study master's paintings, you'll find these lines throughout. It's a great thing to do, but it helps you set up what your 
composition very easily. And it helps you drive you to your focal point of what your passion really is. Now as I go back, so what I do is then I break it down to a warm tonal. This is the warm tonal for the little study that we're going to work after. After I've looked, and you don't have to use Artset Pro. It's just easy for me to play with the shapes while I'm sitting around or having coffee. It's the same thing as doing it on a canvas without getting the paints out. So it makes it easy. Let's say you work on a, you could, even when you work on a painting and later you want to change the painting and you've got a mountain you want to move or a cloud, you can do it on Artset Pro without taking your paints out if you're just sitting around drinking coffee or whatever you're doing. It's a great tool. It's not cheating. It's you're doing all the work still. So anyway, here's my warm tonal. It's done in warm colors and I'll show you how to do it. Once again, it's my, I've changed all my shapes. I've used my clouds as my directionals move in and I've changed the shape of my marsh and the water running through it. As we continue on, you'll see what I'm doing here is I'm working from the focal point out. That becomes critical. It's recently, I had several workshops and I said, what if we work from the focal point out and that way they didn't have to do the whole painting at one time. If you work from the focal point out, things get easier for you. Way, way, way easier. Because you don't, one, you don't have to think about, oh, I got to finish the whole painting. If you, it also builds on itself. If you get one layer right, you get the next layer right. You get whatever's next to that right and whatever's next to that right. So whatever happens there is it starts to build out. And the fun thing is, if you ruin the rest of it out there, you can crop the painting and make it a really good painting anyway, just by cutting it off or having it redone. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I've kind of worked from my focal area out. As I go in, I've done a little more here, just a little more in this area. I'm still creating a focal, but everything is centered around that focal area. I haven't completed anything else outside in the painting. Now, by that focal area, I just want to throw this in. I, back in the area where the color is, especially back in the back part of the marsh, I mixed a whole lot of colors that were all in the same value so that I could get a tremendous amount of color going through the marsh, especially back towards the middle area. We go back to the design here, and here's getting close to the finished product. I've still been building from the focal out, and I haven't completed the bottom part of the marsh yet. Now, this is a crop of the focal area. So the reason, if I didn't want to finish the rest of the painting, or I was in a situation where I ruined the rest of the painting, I could still crop and come up with a painting. So it bites it off so you can deal with it. In other words, if you just get that area right, you could go back later and finish the painting. Let's say you were outside in the plain air painting. You could go back in and probably finish that painting just by getting that little area around the focal area. So this would make one little painting there. Then I cropped it the other way. I've got another little painting here. So I would have never had to finish the painting, plus I bit off only the amount that I could chew at that point. Now, we get to here. This is what the finished painting looks like at all the lead-ins, and this is the studio piece that will be taken to an 18 by 24. So I'll go around now and I'll start to show you a couple of things on design and just how to set up the design. And from that, just from these few things, you should be able to create a great design in your paintings. And this one step will get you where it's not so complicated with words like composition and how do I do it. So let's uh, go around to the easel. We'll do that now. Okay, it's good to be back with you again. And you found your passion, you know what you're gonna paint. So the first thing to do is just set up a couple little simple things. I'm going to talk about design and some of the lines and just a few of the values before we get actually into the tonal. These are so easy to remember so that it's not complicated. And just remember this, if it's not complicated, you'll repeat it. If you don't understand the verbiage or you don't understand how it's working, you won't you'll lose interest, you'll lose your passion. So one of the things that always interested me was when people were talking about all these complicated words that I, I don't even understand it. And um, 
So it's go I'm going to break it down into real simple. For example, drawing. People used to say, oh, he's really a good drawer or she's a great drawer. One of the things there was this. I kept thinking it meant, well, can they get a pencil out or can they draw a face real accurate? Drawing also means this. It also means the ability to create unique and interesting images. And once a person learns how to do that, they can really start to take off. Because the clouds won't stand still, so you have to design them. If you have bad shapes out there, you have to design them and create interesting shapes. So, really good drawers also means they're really good at the creativity of making up shapes. And that become, that's probably a lot harder, actually I know it is, than if you're actually copying something. If you have a perfect picture, and this is going to make a great painting, it's very easy to copy that. If you have to start moving shapes around, moving trees, bushes, creating clouds, everything gets way more complicated. So, I'm going to try to break it down and keep it as simple as possible from what I've watched when I was doing those little clinical trials in my workshops. And it wasn't like we were doing that on purpose. We were just trying things to see how they'd work out. And what, what, if it's easier for you, you're more passionate about it because passion can be anything. So if you're passionate about the scene or you're passionate about looking good or making great paintings or you're passionate about just going outside and painting or you're passionate about I'm getting really good at this. And that's one of the keys sustained happiness is built on having something out there that you can never master but you get better and better and better at it. So being able to actually get better at it without falling in the deep holes is usually caused by keeping it simple till you become well, really an extensive painter with a lot of masterful time behind you. So let's go from here. So everybody knows this. Uh, it's pretty simple. If I'm going to deal with my painting and I'm going to use a strong color here so it's easy to see the um, most of the time if you're dealing with design issues people will hold this out especially if you're outside and you may set a horizon line. So it's just directly out across from your eyes. So let's set a horizon line, something like that. Now, most of the time, this would be like a honey spot, a honey area. These are like what they consider honey areas for focal areas. So whatever is kind of circling around through here, 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 and here is what people consider focal areas. Now, the interesting thing about this you want to. Those lines I was talking about that most of these masters have in their painting, whether they're hidden or whether they're more obvious or whatever is irrelevant. But what they're doing is they determine their passion and their focal area most of the time. And they're trying to get you to this focal area. So they're thinking about the lines that are going to move them into it. So this is the most favored focal area for English speaking people because we read left to right. So what happens is, if, let's say this is going to be my area and I want everything going there. If I'm going to do that, then all I have to do, I'm going to change the color up here just to show, is to come in, have some type of lead in and figure out how I'm going to get you back up into this area and maybe have, I may swing it back. I may have something coming back into this area this way maybe something kicking me back into this area this way and I may repeat it a few times. By those repetitions what's happening is I'm starting to create a movement and I'm walking you through the painting to get you to the painting and the part where I want you to really focus. Now I can have second and tertiary or third, don't use a big word, areas of interest but by creating these design lines before I ever start the painting, first of all by knowing my passionate focal area I really want to hit and drive, I can set these lines at that point. And it's that simple. So when you're creating designs, now your eye will bounce around from light to light and it'll also hold dark lines. So you can use dark lines or lights or whatever just to move you to that area. I may come back in here and see yet another line. So this may move me in also, but I'm paying real close attention at how I'm going to move you. So that's one of the easiest ways to deal with it. Now let me talk about something else. If this is my horizon line, and Carlson is great for dealing with progression and things of that type of nature, but if that's my horizon line, most of the time, 
these other lines will be real strong, say down here, and everything will start to flatten as it gets to the focal point. Same thing here. The clouds will probably be lower and flatter. As I get higher, they're going to create a stronger line or angle. These angles really make paintings interesting when you're really looking at a good painting and you can see how that's done. It makes it really, really interesting. Now the other thing is this. For instance, if I am Another thing that's really good about Carlson is he talks about the different values of a landscape. So just to keep it simple again, it's pretty much this easy. If I assume the sky is the lightest part in the landscape, then the things that stand straight up or silhouetted are the darkest part in the landscape. Usually trees, maybe a bush or marsh, something like that. As things tilt away, so they're not so perpendicular, to the sky, they start to lighten up. So you, then you'd have necks, mountains, rocks, things of that type nature, till I hit the ground plane. And once again, that'll get almost as light as the sky, sometimes lighter if it's water with reflections. But if you keep that in mind, you won't be, when you look at your values, you won't be painting trees that should be the value of the ground plane. So it's not, you could read those four to five, read everything in Carlson, and it's really good, but it's pretty simple. Anything that's standing straight up, and this does not include buildings. Buildings have their own local color, they'll change. And then as they start to go down, so the ground plane will be my lightest, rocks and mountains, mid lane. So that should, if I keep those simple things in mind, it's very easy to create my design. All right, so here we are again. We're going to get ready to really work on this uh, tonal and kind of really pull it together. Now, once again, it's about, I probably when I'm outside, or actually I know when I'm outside, what I'll do is I'll set up, and I know if I do that design line drawing and this type of setup, and I've thrown a few lines on here just to, so that you don't have to see me, and it's gonna be based on this right here. So this is the study and basically what's going to happen is I'm going to work off this design and work off these color harmonies. It's really hard to get color harmony and to just sit in and make them up in your studio without some type of tonal to work, I mean some type of painting to work off of. Even if you have a photo, that photo is probably only picking up about 20-25% of the color, plus it's not picking up that experience in those other decisions that you made outside. So as we get ready to go, uh, my thinking is always this, I'm, I'm always loved color, color's my thing, that's what turns me on about it, that's what caused me to want to paint. The unfortunate thing is most people see shapes first before they see color in a painting, which is, came to me is news even after many years of painting. So for me, getting those shapes right becomes hugely important and getting those designs right becomes really important before I really get to have the color and have all the fun with it. Now one of the things that's interesting is, uh, having taught that many, uh, many workshops, it's very interesting to see that very few people are good at all three. Like they, they can't draw well or they, they either suffer in the color or they suffer in like values. One of those three type things. So you're going to have to work on one or two. I've never seen anybody walk into any type of um, workshop and just be naturally good at all three of those things. So mine, values or actually it's more shapes than anything else, which could be considered drawing. So the fun part is, once I figured out that I, I could do shapes this way and separate it before adding my color to it, then it's a much simpler type deal. It's way easier, I'm not juggling three balls in my head. Once again, if you're a master, you can probably do that. But for most of us, it's a difficult process and to separate the shapes and the values out before you start putting the color on will make you grow way, way, way faster, make your paintings way, way, way better, and you'll start to learn how to see what shapes really look like in values before adding color, which is a great benefit. Da Vinci used to have his students sit there and draw some of the shadows that were on the walls because the more you play with shapes, the better your repertoire of shapes get, the easier you get to deal with them. So as we go, um, and don't forget, 
in the old art schools, they used to make everybody work in black and white for a year or two before they would even let them. And that was just value studies and shape study. So as we break it down, for me, I like color. So I knew I didn't want to do black and white for a year or two. So these warm tonals solved my problem. Plus, they also do this. Most landscape paintings are warm underneath and look better with warm showing through. So when you're looking at trees, grass, whatever, there's usually a layer of warm that's underneath all the greens and the blues. So the warm tonal serves that purpose also. So let me show you, I, like again I said, I put some of the salient points on here so that you wouldn't have to see me just line up this for a long period of time. Now, the quickest way to deal with this is I'm just going to start getting some type of warm colors and I'm going to start laying them on fairly fast. Now for a lot of people, having the ability to figure out the texture of what you need. Now this I'm using, I'll talk about color later. I'm just using some warm colors right now and I'm going to lay on some of my values that relate to this painting. It's much easier to just get it on and use a towel to pull it off or whatever. Don't, it's not too sacred at this point. So if I start to get on some values, nice and thin, because I'm going to want them to dry off real quick, because when I'm playing air painting, what I do is I'll lay this on, and eventually, once this is on there, I'll just, let's say I cover it all in, I'll start to wipe out. If you're a person that has trouble with shapes, it's a lot easier to wipe out the lights than to paint them on there. Now, this is also a great way to play with your paints when they're real thin so that you learn how to play with paint and get the feel in the amount of Gamsol that would go into each one of these uh, brush strokes. So once I start, so I, even if I lay out the bottom like that, now my sky is usually just a little bit lighter, so I may go a hair lighter in my value. Now this also saves you from making all those mistakes with the paint so that you don't have all grayed off paintings at first. So I may go a little bit lighter up here. Now the nice thing about this is you can actually make paintings out of this type of warm tonal and if you, you can make them look exactly like a painting, kind of like the old black and white TVs and they sell actually quite well. There's a lot of artists out there that have no problem with just actually doing a real good design and laying out their shapes on something like this. So just get a rag, whatever it takes to get this on there. So see, I'm, I've already started to move towards my painting. All right, so now I'm going to start getting the values a little closer. Right now this looks like a separation too much. I can see that some of my clouds, a little higher, they're just a little darker up here. And this value down here on my marsh could have gone just a little bit darker probably. So that this value in the sky, the sky is usually a little bit lighter. I'm just laying some of it on and if I overcoat or get outside the lines it's not going to make any difference. The idea of this is that this is just giving you some idea. You're going to correct and fix things as you go the whole way. There. So as I start to get it on there a little bit better, you can get really accurate in these values. And you can, you can start to get these to really look like everything that's out there. It just won't have the color on it.
And now you don't have to get in here. And you see, I see this all the time. People start going real careful. Just get it on there nice and thick, or thin, I mean, but just get it on fast. And don't be worried about your brush strokes. This kind of loosens you up before you start. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and put just a little bit of dark in so I can see where the real darks run in the painting. Same thing, just be careful. This stuff's still going to be real thin because I want it to dry before I start putting real paint on here. Now, I want to show you something that's kind of important. When you're dealing like variety of shapes and lines. So this line that's running, an uninteresting line is just a straight line like this. And so it's uninteresting. If this line moves and gets real interesting in a lot of directions and shapes, I've got a better painting. So just by practicing these type things, I start to get a better feel for my brushwork and what's going on. So if my lines are, this line here is a little farther back than this line here so that they don't end at the same place. So this would be, again, be another boring line. So you're just going to have to start breaking things up and make it interesting. It's so, so important. If you study some of the really, and I've had fortune, and I've got to paint with a lot of really great masters, but if you study their paintings, if you actually go out there and you look at their paintings, and I'm talking about really good painters, you'll see that almost every shape is interesting, different, every line's interesting, different. There's a fellow out there named Jim Reynolds. He wrote a book. I don't know if you can get your hands on it. And it was before he died, he took his paintings and critiqued them all. One of the most unique things he said was, and it kept showing up everywhere, don't isolate a dark. And it was very interesting how if you can see, run this dark line through here, this dark here kind of connects with that dark there. And these lines kind of connect somehow to this back line back here. It's a much more unified painting than if I just come out here and stick a bush out here and leave it all separate by itself. So these type things, if you're playing in color, get really hard to see. And it gets a little more difficult. Whereas if you're out here playing with them just like this, it's very easy just to focus on my shapes and my values at this stage of the painting. So as I continue to go, I just do a little bit of dark on there. See, it's already starting to take shape. I'm starting to get an idea. And I can stay in here a little bit and just keep playing with the paint till I get it exactly on the value. Watch out for light spots like that. What it'll do is it'll cause your value, this whole value. I'm trying to get big value shapes to kind of sit in here nicely so I can see what's going on in the painting. Now the best thing about this is, not only is it helping you, it's also giving, getting you ready so you're making decisions right now that when you start putting the color on, you'll have already dealt with some of the issues and you'll have a better idea of where to put the color and how to fix one of those shapes. Now, so, for a progression, as I go back, usually things get smaller and bigger towards me. And if so, if this area of the marsh underneath is a little bit bigger here, then it would be here. And then even get a little bit smaller back there. And then always an overlap will do the same thing. If I come in here and I overlap, it'll also move that area back there. Same thing here, overlap over there, overlap this front one over that back area back there. So I've kind of been starting to get in pretty good shape here on at least the marsh part, and I've worked out kind of from here. My reflections, they'll just, as long as I get some nice variety going on. So 
so that I don't end up with a box or a triangle or a circle anywhere in my landscape painting because they will not help the painting. So let's just go ahead and finish the water while we're in here. And it's very easy to see. What you'll see is that it's very easy to keep it simplified at this stage of the game and start to see my big shapes. Now, so let's say I'm in this marsh. It's, I've got pretty much the same value running about everywhere. So you can see your value. So I would know that if I came in here and did this, that value is off. It's, it's not good value for my marsh right here. So I would just knock it back out and I start seeing the values all in one color, which is a better way to go. You could also, if you had left a bunch of light in here like this, you can see that that's jumping my value. So this whole plane here it gets jumped in value. And so it's very difficult at that point to um, pull that piece together. So because what I'm trying to do is get these big shapes to come together. Now I also do this. I'll go back here. These trees are bigger, so I may pull some of these forward a little bit and let this, some go back. I may put a little bit of bush run or a couple of bushes of trees right in there and then let some back there, then that back, then maybe that a little forward back here. So that I get an interesting line. Still, all these darks are connected and everything's starting to work the way I want it to. Now as I come back in here, I'm going to just simplify this a little bit so you can see it real clean. And then my dark reflections will be a little bit darker than, than what's out here. So that I can see the reflections. Now, where my sun is, I'm going to go back in up to the top. Let me throw away that. And I'm going to start pulling my light out. I'm going to get to the point where it's so much easier to do this than to paint it on. And I had to leave enough light or area in here for the water if I wanted the water reflection. So if I start to pull out my lightest part there, then I can see how it's going to happen down through here. It's real easy to do this, and you start to see what the painting is going to look like if you get the color on it right. Now, I've had a lot of people at workshops, it's kind of funny, they'll go, I, I now can do the tonal. The color's killing me now. So, but you have to be able to see this part first. The statement that values do all the work, I'd add to it, values and shapes do all the work, and color gets all the glory, is pretty accurate. That's why this is more important, and that's why they had people start with tonal studies, except they were in black and white when they were in art school. I may have said law school. So, as long as these shapes are pretty interesting, I'm kind of in pretty good shape here, pardon the pun, and as we get ready to go, this is what's happened. I can do this even when I'm outside. So if I'm working on this landscape, and it's a, it's a sunset like this, I'm going to start looking at how does this light come out. And on every one of these sunset pieces, you'll see if you're standing out there, and even if you look in the picture, what was really cool here was this light really blasted down into these trees and made them pretty light. And then it keeps on coming, pops in here, and comes down there. It, because I wanted a nice strong point here, I ran a piece of dark from this underlying set of the marsh that's sticking straight up right next to that sunshine so that it popped it really hard. Now I had a piece of light over here that came down also. So I've kind of set it up. Now if some of this stuff 
you can go in here just to clean up everything and get it as clean as you want it. And then I had a little bit of light that was going on back in here. Some that ran over to that side and my angles back into this major focal point area. So you start to see how your whole painting, that line's a little too straight. I can lose some of the edge on it. This can go up just a little bit. And you start to see how your painting now will start to get all the feel you need for it at this point. Now I'm going to go back up and I'm going to still. That light is very interesting. If I, if I can't get as much of the paint off, what I'll do is I'll go in and put a little more Gamsol on the rag and then just start to play with this and start to get the rest of the light. Now this is great fun too. You can do these tonals outside during a sunset just to get an idea of how the light blows away from everything. How it disseminates out and how it breathes into certain other areas. So as I start to get my light to go up, I can see where my light hit and where my lightest parts are going to go. Now this is more, a little more simplified, but what I do is, once I'm outside, or even if I'm inside, once I have a general idea of the direction of my painting and where the light's going to run, then I'll just start moving to the color and starting to, because I have all this other stuff, it starts to work its way out. Is all I'm doing. I'm watching my lines and I'm watching my shapes. This is the great best way that I know for you to learn shapes and to figure out what values and shapes actually mean. And I'll show you a little later about shapes and what I mean by how you can actually change a shape just by working on one side of it so you don't have to redo a shape. So if you're getting bad shapes somewhere or somehow, you'll start to see it and then you'll start to figure out how to change it. So this is, I'm just going to soften this a little bit. The light's coming up from here and it hit this piece right here and it starts to soften. I, they're transitions. So it just starts to soften a little bit, continues to go. Wherever there's light pounding, usually it'll start to transition you'll get a little bit of a transition right next to it so that the edge is not so hard in the wrong places. Um, and like many of you know, I mean, if you've taken from like Matt or somebody like that, you'll know that some of these things, there's a lot of soft edges out there and you're gonna use your edges to actually make the painting, move, help move you around through the painting. There's not as many hard ones as you think there is. And what I try to do is I try to stay away from a big discussion on midtones because the number one thing I want you to see is how light and shade works in a painting. If you start seeing too much of the midtones, you'll start to lose that strong light and shade read which is so important. If that's the passion a lot of times, that glowing light that happens in a painting. So once again, if I go, well, I may need a little more paint out of that area, I'll come back in here, just put a little more mineral spirits, or actually I use Gamsol. All my products are gambling. I love their paints. Uh, I use Rosemary brushes, I like those. Now I want to talk about the panel surface. A lot of times people go, well, oh, I'm having a problem. The paint won't stay in there, it won't do anything. The most important thing that you're dealing with, that paint surface is important. So if I have too slick a panel, the paint will just slide all over everywhere. If I have too 
absorb in a panel, a lot of times it'll eat up a ton of paint. So I just use it like I think it's a one of the clausens. And for me, once I get all that to, once I find the panel I like, I probably won't even ever use another panel because it's become so important. You'll be in a workshop and you walk up and you'll th they'll go, I can't, it's just sliding all over. So they can't do anything like this. They can't pull anything out. And if you tone your panel in advance, obviously you can't do this. So see, I kind of now have everything going. It's pretty good shape. I don't have to worry about it too much. And I spent a little extra time on it just because I wanted you to see what it really should look like before I get started. Again, you know, like uh, Charlie Hunter is a big, um, he does a lot, hardly any color. He's incredible at design. So his designs, he sits there and he really works through stuff like that. So for me, because I know I'm going to get to color eventually, I won't worry as much about the design you can also get something like, uh, some people are really good at their designs, like um, Cindy Barron's really good with her designs. And she, you know, great with shapes, people that are really good with shapes, they really focus on getting those shapes to stay real interesting the whole time. Whereas for me, I'm really into the color, so I'm probably going to go past this a little faster than what most people would. Now, because this still seems a little dark, I can tell from a value perspective, I probably want a little more dark up in here. And I don't want these clouds to get too light because I want it to relate. Everything in painting is relationshipable. In other words, if I get one value, I need to see how that value and that shape relates to another value and another shape. So I got a little bit too light. So see, if, imagine if I've been doing this with color, how many mistakes I would have already made. And look, it's all about failing. You want to get out here and you want to keep trying different things. The more you fail, the better you're going to get, the faster you're going to get there. If you are afraid of failure, you need to get comfortable with it. You, it's just one of those things where it's really going to help you with your painting. Now I got a little more dark on there so I could see it a little better. I was a little bit light in value. And the nice thing about that is you start to learn. Well, that value, if I don't get it close, I could have made a mistake and gotten the whole sky too light and not relate it at all to what's going on down below. That's a lot better. Now what I'll do is it may be a little dark and I just want it a little smoother so it doesn't look so brushy. And this shape down here connects to this shape. Just watching all my shapes. Now I use the blue rags because they don't leave the lint on the on the canvas, and that can be a real issue when you're dealing with uh, if you're doing some wiping out like this. You can use a rag or anything else. So I'll come back in. I can still clean up just a few values just to make them a little better. And then watch again, it's clear my sun. And this reflection down here will be the lightest part. Use your hands, use whatever you need to use. So I can really see kind of how this is going to go. I got a nice light spot going here. It's coming down through here, shooting me down into the painting, just following my design lines that I've already set up. So if I do something like that, see, I can see everything. I can stand back and go, that's what I intended. This is how I really thought about my design. 
and I've kind of got it going on now. I don't have to get too worried if I follow that, and I've got interesting lines, and I start to follow this all the way through. It doesn't have to be dead on accurate, but as long as it's close enough to give me an idea of where I was headed with the painting. So when I step back to look at everything, what I would do is, I just go, that's not too bad. I may lighten it a little bit here. At this stage, see, I can keep playing with my values and go, what looks better? If that marsh, if that marsh is a little bit lighter, it may relate a little more to the sky. Now, when you're squinting down and you're outside, you're not actually determining the exact value. What you're determining is the relationship of the values. In other words, what's the darkest to the next to the next? That's what you're doing when you're squinting. And that squint will really help you when you're painting. So that you, as long as you're lining them up, you can separate the different areas of the landscape. And that's all that matters. You could paint this in high key, a lower key, whatever. As long as my sky is separating from my marsh, my marsh from my reflections and my water. And separation is a big thing to me. I talk about it a lot. So this sun blew out this area of trees back here pretty nicely, which was really, it really adds to the painting. So that's too dark right there. Just get rid of that. And then I have a piece of dark. I have some bushes or stuff. And I use this. They weren't actually out there to kind of come back in. I've got a pretty good design. I'm in shape now, where what I'll do is I'll just turn myself to the color. This line's a little too straight. Things like that, where I can break an edge, that line's a little straight there. So what I did was, I lowered part of the light down into here, because don't forget, these clouds are kind of made up. You're not going to be able ever to stop them, which is kind of fun. So that, what, that really, if you could start painting clouds outside, it's great, because it's what it's doing is teaching you shapes. Because you're having to make them up. You can't copy them. Anytime you're having to make something up and you can't copy it, you're getting better and better and better. And look, that's hard to do, so don't jump into that right away at first. So, I think that's enough on that. I'd leave that where it is. And now we're going, we're going to go to color. I'm going to step away for a minute. And we're going to talk about color in the next phase. And once again, this is about breaking it down so you can, you know, this is how you become really good at certain things. If you get really good at this, then you can get really good at color. If you try to do it all at one time, it's really, really hard, unless you're really an advanced painter, and they can do that. So, anyway, I'll step away now. We'll come back and go to my favorite part, color. Okay, we're back now, because I took a little bit of time off set, so that you didn't have to watch me boringly mix my favorite part, color. Now, it's not as boring as you think, it's just boring to watch. So, by mixing my colors, there's two ways of doing this. Well, there's actually three. Some people just mix as they go and paint. Um, there's a pre-mixing all your colors, which I just did, so that we could move through the painting process a lot faster. So sometimes I'll do this. I think this is the number one way to learn. Pre-mix all your colors, and I'll go through them with you, but you didn't have to see how I did it. There's another way that I'll show you also after I talk about the pre-mixing. Just remember, color is my favorite thing. It's, it's all about harmonies. So it's like if you hear a Bocelli sing, you know when he sounds good, you know when people are off harmony. Usually a discordant color or a color that does not fit in the painting would be something that would be either way too green or way too bright or it's either too warm for a cool painting or too cool for a really warm painting. So if you're painting an overall warm scene, you don't want to have, usually, a big stroke of iridium sitting in it unless it's been dulled down by a red or warmed up somehow. 
Now red is a great modifier. You can put it in your paintings and it'll help to actually set all the paintings down. So if you're mixing, a lot of times people say, if you want to get a harmony, just put a little bit of each of one paint of one color in every, but that's a little bit too simplified in my opinion. So, but you can use red, then you, I have some grays on my palette. But remember this, the more paint you get down on your palette and the more you get up on the painting, the easier it is to see if you've got a paint that's discorded or too cool or too warm or something along that type way. So if I've got a lot of painting down, a lot of paint down on my palette, I can pretty much see what's up on my canvas and therefore I got a really good idea when I put a color up there if it's off. Now the reason it works that way is like I said, all shapes are relative to each other. So is color. So if you have yellow and you look at yellow, you'll see it as yellow if it's isolated. If you add a blue or set that blue right next to that yellow, the yellow now is going to look greener than it did before. I'm not going to talk too much about temperature yet other than to say people go, well, is that a warm or is that a cool? The best way to talk about that is, is it warmer than the other color or is it cooler than the other color? So you get a comparison. That way you don't say, well, if you say red is a warm color, that's not necessarily true. It can come in blue. So an orange or red is usually warmer than a cooler red, obviously, if it has less yellow in it. So most of the time, this go back to uh, Carlson, and you'll also realize this. When, when you're talking about progressions, the first color to fall out going backwards is yellow. So there'll be a lot more yellow in the front of the painting, then it'll go to a little bit redder, and then eventually it ends up in a blue. And that even applies to the sky a lot of times, except right at the horizon line where there's a lot of dirt and atmosphere in the air where it could warm it up. But it'll also go, as it starts to go above the horizon line, it'll get cooler and then warmer to a warm ultramarine blue a lot of times as it gets high in the sky. So those are just general principles, and it's, you know, these type general things are really nice to know and then you can start doing all the exceptions. Now let's talk about the paints just a little bit. So I'm left-handed, but however you set your palette up. As I said, I use the Gamblin's, uh, they're titanium white, ultramarine blue, a cad yellow medium. It's a really nice one. Perylene red, I really like the red and the Viridian. With those four colors, I can go out and pretty much paint anything I want, with the exception of some really unique flowers or things of that type of nature. Sometimes you can't get as cool a color as you may want, like on the Pacific coast. Sometimes that ocean color is really a teal blue. So I stay with those colors. Then I have what they call asphaltum, which is like a, it's like a burnt umber or something, but it works better for me. It's a gambling paint. I can put a touch of red in it, warm, it bends real easy. I can go red, I can put blue and it goes cool. Then I use a golden ochre. And then I go to my grays. Now people, you don't have to have the grays, but I found that when you're learning, having the grays helps you see values and helps you from getting too intense in your color so that you don't, and you don't have enough grays in there to really make the other color pop. So there's like a Portland gray deep, titanium buff, Caucasian flesh, radiant blue. Then I put two greens on. And these are also gambling colors. I've got um, this one, it's called, ooh, I forget, I'll go to this other one, cadmium green and then olive green. And these if mixed together make another beautiful green and then I've stuck at the end, I'm using a touch of their permanent alizarin these days. But these greens just come in handy. You can mix all your greens if you want. It's real fast for me, I'll talk about them later as we go. Now what I've done is, I've started from my focal point. Again, if I work from my focal point out, it's real easy and I'm not trying to deal with all kinds of colors that are just really hard to paint. So what I'm doing is, if I go right to the sunlight and I mix the sunlight and then I'll mix the light, it's yellow, a little yellow darker, a little um, darker even then, a little drop in value, getting a little, and then redder. So it'll go, that sun for some reason is, is a real clean white with just a touch of yellow in it. And then it starts to yellow. And then remember, it goes yellow, 
red, eventually it gets to a blue or a violet blue. So what I'll, all I've done is I've mixed these colors to kind of match up to my painting. And the reason for that is I have a painting to go from. It would be very difficult to paint this painting without something. Now one thing I want you to be careful of, you can't not hold your palette knife up outside and try to say that's the color because this is getting hit from different light than what's out there and it's also not relative to what's around it. Also, same thing here. If I am actually holding up to here, be really careful because if I tilt it, it'll change the light or I change and go that way, it'll change the light. The only sure way is if I coated this with like galkin and then let it dry and then touched it on there. If it disappeared, it would be dead on. But it's close enough a lot of times if I hold it up. So that's how I would use it when I'm in the studio. At now, the one thing that, since all colors are relative, it's very, very difficult to actually paint color or mix color separately unless you're really looking at them next to each other. Now, I was, I was gonna talk about the other way, but first let me explain how you build a puddle and what you think about with colors. People always go, and this is the number one question, everybody hates it. Well, what color did you use and how much of it did you use? That's the, not the best way to be thinking about how you mix colors. It, you can't be looking for recipes. It's not going to work. So the guidelines would be this. I would start thinking, what color do I have? Do I have a blue, a red, or more of a yellow? And am I in the right value? Those would be my top two questions. And then, so I would get a general pile of that. Let's say I was going to mix to this yellow color right here. So I would go, well, I'm probably going to be in the yellow. And then I go, well, that, I can hold that yellow up to here and see it's way too dark. So I want my value's too dark. My color, I'm in the right color. I may start raising the value and it could have gone a little bit cooler. So I just start mixing it that way. Then you're always testing it. You just hold it back up here to see. Now it's fairly close. And then as I move out, see, I know that it could go redder. So I could take that pile, put a touch of my perylene red in. Then if I drop it in value too much, I'll just add a little bit more yellow. But the questions are that. One, value and color. Two, when you start getting to it, am I also in the right temperature? Is it too cool or is it too warm? And temperature is what causes paintings to scintillate. You really want that. You want cools and warms in both your shadows and cools and warms in both your lights. So the, um, it was kind of interesting to me. I didn't know what I was doing. It was my first workshop and I was painting and I, I was reading a book at night while I was taking the workshop and what I realized was, I read this thing about if you're too cool in a warm painting, it's not going to work. If you're too warm in a cool painting, it's not going to work. So I painted a painting and kind of got the cools and warms balancing really well. The instructor came by and said he wanted me to show that painting at the end of class. So something worked there and I've hung on to that ever since. And I've actually found it to be quite true. So there's another great, like a great painter out there. I painted with him a few times. I took his workshop, Michael Lynch. And it was a fun deal because he's probably one of the best painters of brush and trees and just beautiful brushwork. Incredible design, incredible rhythms in his painting. So he paints, and this is the way that's kind of fun. So if he paints like in an area, so in other words, as I did here with just this yellow light and then mixing around it, then he would just stay in this puddle and say, okay, I'm getting a little farther out. I'm a little darker and I may be a little cooler. And he'd be mixing either right next to each other or right on top of them. And that's a great way. If you don't want to take the time to mix the puddles, you just keep painting right in the same area, kind of like the focal point and keep building your way out. So you can paint right in one little area and keep going out. Now, because I've isolated the painting and because I'm really focused on the focal point, I don't have to get carried away with getting all this other stuff right. I showed you those cropped 
paintings of the painting as I was doing it. So it's not something if you're a beginner or you're intermediate that you have to worry about getting all these colors right. Start focusing right in this one little area. And if you get that right, you, you can probably get the rest of them right. So that's the easiest way, and I think that's the way to get to mastery way, way quicker. And use your compliments. So if you've got a, a puddle that's actually too red, then you go, well, it's too red. I want to knock it down, and I've got a color that's the exact value and temperature that would knock it down. Use a green. Use that green if it's dead on. And then if you've got one that's just too bright, use grays to knock them down. These grays are helpful for that matter. There's a big thing that people do in the limited palette now, which is fine. It's a great way to really deal with stuff. For me, this is way faster, especially when I'm outdoors, and it keeps me from getting too gray. Now, the other thing is this. When you start to put the color on, don't be afraid of it at first. Put it on a little stronger than you would normally, if, if it looks too strong, then what's going to happen is you would normally, um, you're gonna, those colors are going to start getting knocked down as you go. And if you don't build up enough color in it to begin with, if you put real strong color on later, it'll look discordant. It'll look out of place unless there's more of it in there. The other thing is this. You can put a little bit of a color on, but if you put a whole bunch of that color on, it may start to look really bad. I'll show you that as we go through the painting of what a discordant color would look like. So if I've got these beautiful colors mixed right here, and I slam a piece of Iridian straight out of the tube right there, that's going to be discordant amongst all these colors. Same thing here. This green is probably too much, but it may be okay. So I will deal with these type issues as we get into the painting much easier. So now that we've done the paint and how to play with the colors, we're going to go ahead and paint the painting and start bringing it together. And I'll show you how working from that focal out and how it worked in my workshops where people were getting way better paintings just by working from the focal out than they were if they were trying to mix and get the whole painting going together at one time. All right, so we'll take a short break. We'll come back and we'll paint this painting. Hey, would you like to win a beautiful painting worth almost $3,000? We've got a beautiful Joe McGurl plein air study that he's done of the sunset in Maine. It's gorgeous. If you want to have an opportunity to win it, go to paintinggiveaway.com. Just put in your email. That's all you've got to do, and you only need to enter once. We'll be giving away the prize at the end of May. Go to paintinggiveaway.com. What is it about some paintings and some painters that seem to capture the spirit of a scene? So you can feel the essence of the landscape and feel the glow of the light? How great would it be to put your brush to the canvas and create a stunning landscape painting featuring a truly magical sunset where the light glows? Great painters understand that painting isn't just a rendering or a recreation of a photograph. A great painting exudes emotion and feeling. Creating paintings like this is a skill that award-winning artist Bill Davidson not only possesses, he can teach others to create this feeling in their own paintings. His proven approach to painting is all about creating harmony within the composition to make light glow. Now, Bill will show you his techniques and how you can produce your own stunning landscape paintings. You'll discover how to make light appear to glow, what you need to know to create harmony, great ways to draw the eye and create a focal point, the number one thing you need to know to create truly wonderful paintings, plus a whole lot more. As well as being a fantastic painter, Bill is also an incredible teacher of painting. He's taught more than 100 workshops. And now, in this exclusive video release, you get the benefit from all his teaching experience. How to Paint Glowing Landscapes with Bill Davidson is available now on DVD and streaming video. Well, that was the segment from How to Paint Glowing Landscapes with Bill Davidson, one of our most popular instructors. You can learn more about that at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's learn more about Bill.
Hi, I'm Eric Rhodes, and today we're interviewing Bill Davidson. Bill, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So you're like this overnight success. You've just appeared on the scene suddenly, and you're, you're taking over the plein air world by storm, the landscape world. I'm sure it's not quite la like that, not quite that easy, but how'd that happen? Well, I think, uh, first of all, I'm probably not taking it over and by far. You know, I think probably what happens is um, I'm willing to put in the effort, okay? So that's kind of how it all comes about. I think I really, um, I feel like I had a lot of really good people that helped me get, and I feel like I'm standing on a bunch of people's shoulders, and I think I got a long way to go. There's some really good painters out there. So I feel like I'm still way down at the heap and trying to work my way up, but um, it was really started by really good people, I think. Um, and part of the thing is this, uh, I think it's a matter of curiosity. So for me, I was very excited about painting, and I think you have to learn to lose your judgment. So um, what happened was I was probably the very worst painter that ever started painting ever, period. I, I think that was actually me. I <laughs> it, you know, I'm willing to do battle on that one. But, and I think pe um, it seems like people have a romance with the idea that there's some type of magic put on you and all of a sudden you're a great artist, whereas it's clearly all effort. And I was reading the other day a book called Grit, which is really an interesting book. And I like the term persever perseverance better than grit. But it was interesting how they said a lot of times the people that are the worst in the beginning actually learn it really well because they're really not flying through the beginning parts. But I, I mean, it's so, uh, it all goes back to that Michael Jordan thing. Those people that put, you know, he, they say, you know, everybody says, what a great, he did thousands of basketball shots. So it's, uh, I had really good people too. I had a guy named uh, Damon Carter. He was, a, he, he was a illustrator and I worked with him a lot. And uh, then I worked with, uh, I went to like 20 workshops in three years. I wanted to fast track it. So I wanted to learn as much as I could, as fast as I could. And I think that that's part of it. I mean, going to really good people and learning, and learning things is a lot faster than sitting in your studio doing bad habits and repeating it over and over again, I think. Well, and, and you're selling a lot of work right now. It's working out pretty good, Yeah, you know. Um, so there's something that people don't know about you, probably, and that is that you were a trial lawyer. Yeah, that's correct. I always call it a recovering trial lawyer because at first I wouldn't even tell people I was a lawyer. But because, you know, people, people automatically you're disliked. You know, when an artist is pretty well as a general rule liked. Most, uh, most lawyers are pretty much hated or despised most of the time. So do you have a self-esteem problem? Uh, it, probably now, yeah. <laughs> I think any time you're an artist and you face a new painting, you, it's a, you know, I think you always realize I'm never going to get there, and so it's a struggle to always get there. So you spent a lot of years doing that, and how did that, how did you end up from something so much the opposite of being a trial lawyer to being an artist, how did that all come about? I think what happened was I hit a period where I went, you know, uh, at first doing certain types of the law was exciting and everything and then it becomes more of a business and more about a lot about money and I thought you know I need a lot more meaning in my life I've got to figure out a way to get it and so I went to it was funny people go oh you must have taken art when you were a child I you know I never did I did athletics and stuff like that that most guys do and you grow up and you're told earn a living and you kind of know certain things though I was interested in different things like interested in French but I was made to take Spanish I've been to France six times teaching workshops. I've never been to Spain. It's kind of funny how you kind of know. But at, I just went to a, a little art thing and I got into it. Once I started going to workshops, I was totally into it. And who was the first workshop you took? Uh, a guy named Ovanis Barbarian because oh, he was. He's so good. He's, yeah, he had incredible brush strokes. And it was really uh, just because of the strokes I wanted, I liked nice, thick, textured, strokey work, and you know, and I really didn't know who to take from at that point in time, so I just started going, and um, it turned out to be a, just a great benefit, and then I happened to meet this illustrator guy, and I think people need that. You really need supportive people, and I've had them around you, helping you get better. 
So did you just uh, one day say, you know, I'm hanging up my trial lawyer suit and going to go put on my artist suit, or did you transition into this? I think uh, I transitioned, and it, you know, one of the things was, you know, you can read that book by Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth, and he can talk about you find your passion, once you do it, invisible hands come up. Well, it kind of happened that way. I, and I, if I look back on it, I read in certain books, it says, just jump and go do it. Well, in retrospect, if I had done that, I don't think it would have worked. For the reason, I would have been in the studio going, not knowing how to paint before. I think it's a transition thing people really need to go through. So what's your advice to somebody who's in a, in a role that they kind of want to get out of, they've done it, they may have loved it at one time, but now they want to move on to becoming a successful full-time artist. What do you tell them? You know, I, and I get that question a lot in the workshops, and I think for me it's, it's uh, pretty simple. You have to, uh, if you've got the interest, you've got to all of a sudden set up a situation where you can get educated. I think the number one problem for people is if you teach at a lot of workshops, you find out that they don't paint or they quit painting for some reason. And it's usually because they don't know the next step. So they're stuck and they can't get to the next step or they don't understand it. It's not simplified enough. Um, and I think if you look at it from a big perspective, um, you'll see that people go, oh, I just want to be an artist. And everything takes steps, small, tiny steps. And if you do it over a long period of time, you eventually get there. And I think that, you know, if I can break it down and go tomorrow, I'll work for four hours on learning the nuances of clouds. And I do things like that, even if it's not four hours, but if it's small enough to bite off, I think it really helps. Well, that's called chunk learning, right? So I don't know if you were there, but we had a session about that with Brian Mark Taylor at the Plein Air Convention. The concept is that you pick one small thing. Let's say you're learning to play piano. Rather than learning, trying to learn the whole song, you learn the first three notes and you do the first three notes over and over and over again in, in perfect practice and you start out slow and then you get faster and faster till you're at the right tempo and then you learn the next three notes and that cements in your head and that's what chunk learning is like and so we we actually just released a DVD on chunk learning for artists giving them a system so they can follow that and practice little pieces at a time so you were doing that with clouds yeah, and I do it with pretty much everything, and I think uh, part of the problem is this. People want to get a good painting right away, and they're too focused on that. And um, it's funny, I started a workshop about four years ago. It was called an advanced workshop, and I said, what we're going to do is break it all down. And this is one of those things where you go, I'm going to build it, nobody's going to come. Right. Because I was telling people, I said, be prepared. The first day, we're going to do nothing but rocks because they have hard edges and most people struggle with shapes. I mean, that's the, really one of the biggest things people struggle with. So it fills up all the time and it's on overload right now but because people don't want to go home. And one of the, the, one of the good things about the learning thing is what they're trying to do, and I think the guy from uh, Seattle Seahawks, he practices this, to teach people perseverance. How do you, once they're motivated and have an interest, how do you teach them to persevere? And that's part of it. If you're not going to sit at home and, and want to do that yourself, get with a group or go to a workshop where they drag you through that. Because if you're with the group, you will do that. Because I ask people, how many of you are going to go home and spend three or four hours and paint rocks? Well, nobody's going to do that on their own, except for maybe a few people. So whatever happens, you know, I think part of it's getting people to do it. And I think the other problem is people don't always understand. Like when I was taking workshops, a lot of times an instructor wouldn't talk a lot. And for me, the key was to get in their head and to figure out exactly what they're doing. Or if it's too obtuse, you go, I can't do it. I don't get it. I don't understand what they're talking about. Um, so for me, I always say this. You won't hear it till you're ready to hear it. Um, and for the reason is this, it always turns out that um, you could hear it a million times, but all of a sudden you're at that certain level where now you can get it. It clicks. Yeah. 
And there's a great portrait painter that was uh, next to my studio in Atlanta, a guy named Mark Shotoff. And um, <laughs> I'd go over there and take a figure, or take it every now and then, just so I could understand what, you always want to be back at the beginner's level when you're teaching so that you can understand. So he'd get, tell me five things. Well, the first two was all I could get. Right. The other three went right past me because I was still struggling with the first two. Um, so I always find that interesting, and I find it very interesting. There's so much great stuff out now on how you learn better and how, how you get there and um, the motivation part and how you help people get to that perseverance level. Um, and, and I think part of it's curiosity, and uh, you, you know, at the one plane air convention, and who was the head note speaker a year ago? Uh, George Carlson. George Carlson. He made a great statement. I have to reinvent myself every 10 years. And I thought, that is how you keep it fresh. Because for me, when I first started, I was the happiest person going to workshops because I was terrible and it didn't bother me. So I, I was just learning. So I, I didn't have any judgment of what I was doing. And it's kind of funny, uh, Carlson said, you have to reinvent yourself. And I keep thinking, but you do. And for when you're first starting, it's a novelty. You know, everything's novel. But for people that have been painting a while, they find nuances. Well, I think that was a fabulous example because George, for instance, was a very successful sculptor. Hugely successful, major sculptor around the world that he had done at very high prices. And he could have been set for life doing that, but he abandoned that and said, okay, I'm going to become a painter now. He started out as a painter, then he became a sculptor, and then he decided to really master painting. And so he wasn't clinging, and, and I think one of the things that happens is that people cling to whatever it is they have. They cling to a job that they don't really love, or they cling to where they are, because growth is scary, for some people anyway. Obviously not you. Well, yeah, you know, I think it's, it is for everybody, but I think part of it is that's what keeps, you know, for me, You've got, to, you've got to lead your life. In other words, you start creating this artist's life, which is so great because the artists are so great. Most of them are so sharing and so much fun, and they're a pleasure to be around. And there's some really great artists. And so if I go, I went painting with uh, Michael Lynch, who to me is just a fabulous landscape painter, and he, he's a great guy. And he's just, he's just about, you know, just go paint, get it. You know, and then he's also challenge yourself, move yourself. And I saw a little clip on Facebook the other day with David Bowie talking about your best works when you don't really feel like your feet are touching the ground. So I think you get bored sometimes, and I think you have to find those nuances. So it, I think uh, it's funny, you know. And if you're around people that are doing it, like for me, this is a great thing. I always go, all right, I got, I got to shake it up a little. I'm starting to get bored with what I'm doing. So I go like this. I took a. I took a Cindy Barron watercolor workshop, and she's great with her shapes and her values and everything. And I, I can't, I can barely draw. I'm a painter, and it was the most interesting thing to me to see how it all came together. That was really cool. And then the next, so every year I try to take something. The next year I took a Michael Lynch workshop, and he hadn't taught in a long time. And uh, 20 years ago, in one of his workshops, he had like uh, Matt Smith, Bill Anton, and Ralph Oldberg. So you can imagine this guy. Great guy, great painter too. Um, so it's all, all these people I've got something from and you get to build on it, which is really nice. Well, you know, when you talk to the best painters out there, you find that they all do that. They're all continually educating themselves. Most of them are not resting on their laurels. They want to push themselves to the next level. I, I've talked to many who will say, well, I'll take a workshop from this guy or from this lady because they are really good at one particular thing, clouds or rocks or skies or edges, and so they'll study. And so they're always pushing themselves. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a huge benefit, and to be able to do that is, uh, you gotta, I think you have to lose all judgment of yourself. You know, when you're a kid, you don't really know you're doing anything wrong until you start getting a little older. So I, I feel like uh, it's, like if you go in, let's say you go into a competition or something, or you do a paint out or something, if you go in there with two ideas of mine, 
contribution and growth and you don't think about sales or anything else or about am I going to win an award, everything always works out for the best. Right, right so, but it's hard to put that out of your head, isn't it? Isn't you know, that kind of in the back of your head, well, somebody's going to really love this and buy it? You know, that's a good question, but I think what happens is this. Now, the first time I tried it was I was going into an event where I was from the East Coast with a bunch of Western painters, and I went, well, this may not turn out so well for me. And so <laughs> I thought like that, but then when I, I said, well, the best thing I can do is learn to paint like, you know, to really grow here and to contribute, and it worked out really good. It turned out that everything worked out fine for me, and I thought, you know, that's the way to go in. So now in my mind, I go, anytime I start to get judgmental to myself or think, what's everybody going to think? I go, just same thing, contribution and growth, and then I know it's probably going to work out. And it doesn't, you know, they never always do. You know, and Michael Lynch even said the same thing. He goes, you know, I was painting around all these great painters. He goes, as soon as I said, I don't really care what everybody else thinks about how I paint, he goes, that's when everything fell in place. Yeah, you know, that's pretty intimidating, isn't it? Yeah. You, you set up next to somebody who's well known and you kind of want to impress them with what you know. <laughs> you got to lose all that. You find out very quickly you don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> the sooner you lose that, the fat, you know, it's always interesting to me, if you keep it simple, like for me, as a trial lawyer, we used to break everything down to a sixth grade level. I, I've been in workshops where I thought, what are they talking about? This sounds like nuclear physics. It needs to be so simplified so that when you're out there playing or painting or painting from life, all of a sudden you go, okay, I know, you know, and you can talk to yourself a little bit and know what to do. So how do you break painting down to a sixth grade level? Uh, I think, you know, it, it gets kind of fun if you... One of the big problems that I learned was I thought, how am I going to fast track it? So um, I was able to piece together some of it. So let's say if I, if I go all the way back, I have Damon Carter who was really helpful because he was focusing me on shapes. Now for me, I think what happens is uh, people are either, especially when I watch workshops, it's kind of interesting to see. People are either good with their color or they're good with their value or they're good with their shapes but I've never seen anybody naturally good with all three of them. You mean attendees? Yeah, and I mean, I think if you've reached a certain level and you've been painting for 20, 25 years and you know what you're doing, they, they can fly by, okay? But the problem is when you're in the learning process, you have to break it down. So I was going, let's see, so from Ned Mueller once told me, I, had a, I, got into, I did a one day I somehow I ended up in a one day and he goes, if you did value studies for two years, you'd jump way ahead of everybody. Well, because I don't like to draw, and color was the only thing I was even halfway good at, I thought, well, that's not going to work very good. So um, I remember seeing these warm tonals. So I thought, well, if I could just figure out those, then I could put the color on them, which was the part I liked. So by doing the warm tonals, I got to use paint immediately. I didn't have to use a pencil and do black and white. So I think people have to find what works for them. Because I don't like to draw, I don't like to do little sketches, but I love the way paint moves. So if I did a warm tonal first, I got all my values and my shapes right, and I, and I could premix my colors. And I, I picked that part up from Christensen. And so there was a premixing there. And then I picked part of the values up of the landscapes from Matt Smith. And so I was able to go, let's do the tonal first, then mix the color, then put it on, and then learn the paint application and the edges for the last. Well, I think breaking it down really makes a lot of sense because you, you really, you know, you know, there's just so much information you have to think about. You know, it's like, it, really painting is like, um, sitting down in the cockpit of a 747 and having all these gauges, right? You got to think about edges, you got to think about color, you got to think about value, you got to think about atmospheric perspective, and so on. And so if you can just do one at a time like you did, master it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, here's, and this is, people go, oh, well, I don't really, I go, well, think about it this way. If I set up my tonal, and I was terrible at shapes, my trees looked like the pillars of the Supreme Court building when I first started. <laughs> there was no variety, no interest, no nothing. So I would go like this. I would go, it took me a while to get even some shapes. And I read one time that Leonardo da Vinci said, hey, 
he had his students, they were, they were taking the stains off the walls and just practicing shapes because it increases your repertoire of shapes. Well, like a Cindy Baring, she could nail them. So, but certain people like me struggle with them. And from watching workshop people, that's their number one issue. So doing the tonal up front without the color involved isolates it for you. And for me, even when I go in a, when I don't do them really anymore, I'm, uh, but when I was in a competition, I would, I would do my tonal. You don't do competitions anymore? Uh, I'll do, uh, I think I'm doing Laguna Beach this year, um, but I don't really do them anymore. Um, because? I think it's just at some point you get kind of, and I never did a lot of them. Um, although I don't think there's a good camaraderie among a lot of those people, and I really like meeting some of the young guns is what I call them, because they're a lot of fun. And, uh, but I think, uh, and I think people give competition the wrong word. I think the purpose of competition is to make you a better painter. Elevate it's, you. Yeah, it's not to beat somebody else. But um, I think kind of where I am, I like to teach. It's one of my passions. I spend time trying to figure out what makes a great painting. And then I read all the time this, the new science that has come out on how do people learn better, what keeps them motivated. All these new books out, Essentialism, Creativity, Grit, uh, all these things are amazing at talking about how you do deliberate practice and how you get somebody to give you feedback. So that to me is a huge interest in, and I really enjoy it. Well, you're always learning. Yeah. Now, are you reading art books? Um, I don't know that I've read any art. Oh, there is one. If I feel like I'm getting bored or I'm let down, I just pick up Robert Andre's The Art Spirit. If that won't lift you up, it's going to be a long day. <laughs> that book is amazing because he talk, he's talking about the passion. And I always say this to people, it, and I don't think people know all the time. If you can answer two questions, what do you love to paint and how would you love for your painting to look? If you can put those down, you can probably do a pretty good painting. And what do you think makes a great painting? You know, that's the toughest question in the world. I think that's one of those things where you go, uh, you know it when you see it, how do you describe it? But I do think part of it's this, if, um, I think it's an emotional connection. Uh, I think when the sum of all the parts really fit together and is greater than the sum of the parts. And see, all this to me is like speaking in legalese, it's esoterical. I, I don't really, it's, it's hard to answer that. I mean, if, the, if people can go like this, if you're real logical, they go, well, if the values are all working dead on, and you've got great edge work, there's a beautiful color harmony, and you, you know, um, and, and that's where people go. And of course, that's great, but that doesn't always, the, you know, it has to have a ton of interest. And I think that's one of the things that, um, it's really interesting. You'll be working on a painting, you go, just nothing working. And then, uh, but it may be lacking interest, but for me, one of the big things that people miss, and uh, it's real interesting when a competition comes to your hometown city, you have a bunch of people that are taking workshops from you, and they go in and they go, now we see exactly what you're telling us is dead on. Or they go to the plain air convention and they go, wow, that's dead on. Shade and light to me is critical. Like, I love the feeling of light in a painting. So um, if, it, if I can feel the warmth of the light and the cool, and then everything else is together, I spent, I was in a competition one time, and I spent, I said, I was sitting out there and I was painting in the Tetons and I went, you know, I'm going to get the lighting on that Mount Moran just right. And I'm going to stand here for the next 15 minutes till I get the light and shade to read. And sometimes it's a quarter of value up, quarter value down. A little temperature shift, a little warmer in the light, a little cooler here. And uh, finally I got it and I said, that looks just, it feels right. Everything's right there. That was my first painting that sold out of that show. So I think, you know, for some people that's very important. Other people tend to be more focused on just shapes. I don't know. So I, I don't pretend to know it all. I mean, it, it's so hard to figure out. Sometimes I can't figure out what's going on. So where is this all going for you? What are you going to do next? You know, it's, I've been thinking about that. I'm at the back like the 10 to 12 year period. Yeah. It's time to reinvent. You're going to start knitting? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... Uh, I, you know, it's so interesting because I think, um, this is funny, 
it's it's all perseverance so i i've gone from novelty now it's the fun part it's nuance how can i make a, this landscape work better what could make these you know just take a section of clouds what makes them better what makes a set of rocks you get into that and then i thought you know I'm going to try something else too because I believe in this tiny step working. Uh, it's the same thing for me. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is work out. I set up a ritual. I know that's what I've got to do. Okay. Then I go through my reading. I do everything. So I don't start painting till probably one in the afternoon unless I'm on a trip. And then I'll only paint for four hours because it's so intense. And it's specifically in, inclined to do that. So, um, so I, it's a ritual. Right. I think rituals are very important for people. You know, you got to have a routine that you go through in the morning to kind of get to set the tone of your day, to get, you know, to get certain things done. Obviously, working out is terrific for you. Well, I mean, you want your energy, I think, don't you? Absolutely. But I, I, I find it interesting that you work out and then you read. You're feeding your mind. Yeah. Well, it's so all these new, they're all, I like science based things so that I'm not like floating out here. So when somebody says, if you do this, if you have deliberate practice, and that best line was, how do you coach somebody perseverance? Because if they keep doing it, they'll become good at it at some point. So what is it that you learned as a trial lawyer that applies to painting? There's more logic in painting than people realize. Went setting up the shapes, setting up the values, and setting up the design, design, design is for me the hardest part of the painting. It's also the most logical part of the painting. And for me, I have to get through that first 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, if it's a simple design, if it's more complex, it takes longer than that. So there's more logic involved. And it also, if you keep it simplified in your mind, you're way better off. For example, if people talk about, if you read Carlson and you talk about all the general rules, like what's the darkest part of the landscape? So he'll go through the whole process. Well, if you go like this and go, the light source is the sky and the trees, the silhouette, it's standing straight up. So it's next darkest. Then you tilt and all of a sudden you're picking up rocks and mountains and then all the way down to the ground plane. Stay simple in your mind. So when you're out there, you can focus on it like that. Just in case you get it, everything has exceptions and different things when you're out there, but having the general guidelines in your head is really helpful. Part of it's just that if you, if you want to do it, uh, stay with it. One of the best things, one of the other things that you learn about it, this is, what I like about art is I'm creating that old painting. It's my creation. If I mess it up, it's my fault. And this is a good thing that I think that's critical. In the book Grit, they now say in that you could actually increase your IQ and increase your abilities in areas, which means you can grow your brain. So um, one of the things is this. If you get up, you know, everything else, if it's intrinsically motivated and you say, this is how I'm motivating myself, then it's not subject to those external factors like awards and things like that. And primarily intrinsically, I mean, outside things are important, yeah, but it doesn't need to be the primary focus of why you're painting. Uh, but the most interesting thing about it was that um, if you can increase your brain like that, and you can increase your abilities like that, and you just stay with it, you're in control of that. And so you control your own attitude and beliefs also. So like people go, well, I get up and I just don't feel good. Well, that's your choice. Now, it's easier said than done, but the more you work on that morning ritual, the easier it is to create your choice. Well, it's like going to the gym. Most people don't feel like going to the gym in the morning. I drag myself to the gym because I know if I don't, I'll regret it, but then my mood changes. I feel better. Yeah, and that choice, you know, sometimes you're going to get beat up, but at least you've made that. The ritual, and they say rituals are really hard to change. So that guy, in the, there's a book out called Happy, or the guy, it's number one attended class at Harvard University, and the guy goes, you may change one ritual at a time, 
maybe two. Any more is going to be a failure. So, you know. And a lot of that, uh, a lot of that starts with gratitude, yeah. right? Appreciating what you have because that really impacts your, your mood. You know, you think about what you're going through in your life compared to what somebody else is going through and suddenly what's bad seems good. That's, that's a huge point. I'm glad you brought that up. It's really interesting to me because uh, I had a theologian for an aunt and she was, uh, she was a Catholic nun. And I don't think I've ever met a more grateful person in my life, but she was a lot of fun. As soon as she didn't have to wear the habit, she liked to drink wine, but she had met Bon Bron, she knew the Dalai Lama, all these type things. But that was the number one thing, and she said, that's it. And so then all of a sudden you read all the books and they now say that's the number one key to happiness. And that if you could get up every morning and write three things you're grateful for and do it for 20 something days in a row or 20 days in a row, It'll change your whole outlook on life. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the things. And the other is uh, thanking people. You know, I like to get up in the morning and send out a couple of emails to people and go, hey, I really appreciate what you did and thanks for helping me with that or whatever. And that helps too. Yeah, actually, what I, it, it's interesting because I, I just heard, I was listening to a podcast or a tape or something, and uh, the guy said, you know, open up your morning with gratitude and then think about three people that you're grateful for, maybe from the day before, somebody's done something for you, and then send them an email right away or, or get on the phone and call them. And so I decided to start trying that. And it's amazing how it makes me feel, but it's also amazing how it's making them feel because people are not recognized as much as they should be. Yeah, and it's amazing how when you sit down and you think about that, how all of a sudden it could have been just some little thing yesterday, and how all of a sudden you send that email to them, and they're just so excited about it, and they, they, you get something nice back. Yeah, and they're passing it on to others, yeah. right? Because when they're feeling good, it's the same with confidence. When you're confident, you know, then it, you lift other people up, and then those people will get confident, lift others up, and so on. That's a... Uh... I never even thought about the confidence part. Well, there you go. You know, that's a big help. <laughs> and I, because I always say this, you need to be around supportive. Uh, I was lucky. I, I ran into people that were supportive and that were helpful. And, and look, a bad person can drag you down. Very and, rapidly. And it can really, and life's too short for that. I know everybody says that, but so we go on a, I usually take a workshop to Italy or France or something once a year. And the number one thing I know is once you get far away like that, it's very easy for people to start to slide. They're far away. They want to think they're painting. They can paint better, you know, and that type of thing. And so I, I, it's, there's a pep talk up front, you know. One of them is no whining. Two, if you start, you know, spiral up. Because if you start going down, you need to catch it fast. So how do you spiral up? Well, I think you recognize first. Awareness is the number one key. You go, all right, look. I'm starting to go down, my thoughts are negative. If I can't change my thought myself by substituting another thought, I go tell somebody real quick, hey, I'm having a problem right here, I need to think about, you know, help me out a little bit. So, in other words, your self-talk, if you start saying, hey, I'm, you know, this painting is awful, I'm not doing a good job with it, then you, you gotta pull yourself out of that, that mindset? Yeah, and if you can't do it, you need to go get help. People are too afraid to ask for help. Like, there's a great guy, this guy's a really good painter in the Northeast, Jonathan McPhillips, and he goes like this. He goes, you know, I got tired of looking at my paintings, critiquing them all the time. He goes, well, finally, I just started saying, I'm going to start talking about what's good in them first, and then I'm going to start talking about it. And I thought, you know, that is a great idea. That is a great idea. Because we're all so critical of what we're doing that nobody's going, hey, you did a great job, you know? Yeah, and you know, when you think back to when we were children and we were playing with crayons, I don't think we were critical about any of that. We were just there to enjoy the process. Yeah, and so how, how's the question where you go, the tough one is this, painting's hard. You're in there, you're in your studio. You got, you got four hours to go on this big one. It's not working. <laughs> you're... Yeah, it's hard, but at the same time, you know, you could be working on a road crew somewhere. That's hard. That's hard. Yeah. But, and so I always go, enjoy the process. I, and then I love that. What's the one about the three people that were the brick masons on the, on the uh, big 
chapel and one of them goes hey what are you doing he goes oh i gotta put this brick and mortar together you know this is a tough job he goes i gotta show up every day the next guy goes you know it's not a bad job i just i'm getting pretty good at it and i can earn a living for my family the third guy goes oh my god this is the greatest job in the world i get to build a chapel this this, this is beauty i'm learning and i'm putting out beauty every day so what's the difference attitude right that's all it is right so how do you change it by getting some help sometimes. You know, I used to think, what's that great line? If you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with others. Because, it, you know, when you grow up and, you, and you're taught, well, you got to get out there and earn a living and take care, you know, whatever, you think, i got to go do this on my own. You don't realize how much help you've had along the way. Absolutely critical. So it's so nice to, you know, that's what I think is nice about the artist community. First of all, they seem to be really fun people. They're easy, I, you know, and there's not, there's some egoism, but boy, you better check that at the door if you really want to hang out. Yeah. So final thoughts for anybody who might be uh, uh, learning to paint, um, watching this and struggling a little bit. Any final thoughts? Yeah, I think the number one thing to do is to be ready to lose any judgment of how you of what you're going to paint and how it's going to turn out. Don't get too invested in what you're painting. Absolutely not. And, and don't judge your paintings. I mean, go through like you're in college and you're in the learning period. And if you keep that attitude the whole time, it's a really great thing. Number two, and this especially applies to men, get out of your studios, get to some workshops and get around some people that can paint and help you grow. Because, and look, you can tell. If the people, if the teachers, and there's a lot of good ones out there, are trying to help you and you sense that, then you stay with them. It, you know, those are great teachers. And you may have to move around and get a few other things from some other people. Uh, don't get caught up where there's some, it's egotistical or it's about that person, the teacher. The teacher's supposed to bring out in you. Which, you know, everybody finds their own authentic voice at some point. You're going to paint a little bit like your teachers at first. But as long as you're not copying, and your style's gonna come to you. Don't, look, this is a great thing that I learned. You can sit there and go, I'm gonna sit here in my room till I figure out my style. That is not gonna work, right. okay? Same thing on creativity. If I, if you go, I don't know what to paint today, pick up an art book, get outside, start painting, it'll all of a sudden come to you. Be real reflective, keep up your journals, but make sure you're getting help when you're around the positive people. That makes all the difference in the world. Keep know? up journals. Tell me about that. Well, like for instance, I'll always write, uh, what do I really love to paint? What would I really love, you know, like I like the fall. I love the yellow trees. I like to be in that atmosphere. I, so I'll keep writing and if you're not aware and you're not being reflective at some point of what you really like and picking up those finer threads, you've got too many choices. It, and you know what? That's, all, that's a hard thing because all of a sudden you're sitting there going, oh my God, I like everything, okay? We all, you know, that's a very easy situation to fall into. But some things, and it was in one of the good books, it was in the happier book, I think, the guy did, would do three circles. What do I really like? What I really, really like? And what do I really, really, really like? And you've got to get into that third circle to stay motivated and to really keep going. So, um, I, you know, because at first I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went, what was my passion? So it's funny, when I left, I, would left, where, I left somewhere, I was teaching a workshop or something, I sat down on an airplane next to an artist coach. And she goes, I hate that. The word pa she goes, I love the word passion, but people won't commit. You know, they come in, I go, if you don't want to commit. But I think it's an evolving process. So for me, before I knew what I wanted to do or where I want to move, I would take the questions in what color is your parachute where people were changing careers and figure out what did I really want to do. And, and then I would I'd just watch it and let it evolve and evolve. So now, so this is what happens. So, I, and then you develop that perseverance and you get a coach to stay with you. So somehow you get people to help you. So I was sitting there the other day and I went, God, I never thought I'd do this, but I want to go take singing lessons. 
<laughs> and you know, and you know, I can't sing. In, in second grade, I was told just to mouth the words and not sing in the choir. Ever since that time, I thought it's just over for me. Yeah, well, they shut, they shut you down. The first thing that I and you know, people always go like this: don't quit your day job. Well, right. undeterred, I'm going to. Don't be deterred by anything. Keep going, because the first thing that singing coach says, it's not for you to judge how you're singing. It's for me to help you get better. So anytime you're, we're our own worst judges of our artwork. Don't judge your artwork. I always pick, I go like this. I go, this is the painting I love. This is my very best painting. I'll put them up in front of a workshop class and everybody likes the other one. Don't judge your own work. And, you're, and you know, get people to help you with it. One of the funniest things that ever happened to me was this guy, Damon Carter, I was working on a painting. He goes, that's a good mountain painting. I said, I kind of like it. He goes, that's pretty good. So he goes like this. He goes, let's you clay it, and then we'll each have it before you get rid of it. I said, that's perfect. So we should clay it. Now, we've been looking at this mountain painting for about two weeks. This guy is an incredible eye for shapes. We put it up there. There's a big square right in the center of the mountain after it's been chiclade and everything. So what? I changed the edge of a shape. And, we, uh, and that fixes it, submitted it into a big national contest. And I'm in bed one morning, I get an email from an artist goes, oh, why aren't you here? You just won the best landscape award from <laughs> Everett Raymond Kinsler. If, that, if I hadn't asked or he hadn't seen that shape issue, it would have never even got in the contest. So get help from your friends. It's big. Yeah, masterminds, or, you know, coaching from friends mastermind groups, you know, getting together with people and helping each other with your problems. You know, if you're in a local community and you've got a bunch of good painters around you, get them to give you constant input and feedback. You're not going to get that that feedback from your mother. They're going to yeah. they're going to tell you they love it. And you want it honest. Yeah. Much rather rather you find out right then before you hang it in a gallery wall or it's in a big show. Yeah. My daughter will walk into my studio and she'll say, Dad, the head's too big. That tree's wrong. You know, no training, but she can see what I can't see. Good eyes, yeah. yeah. And see, it's always interesting to me when you're teaching a workshop and you go in an area and they go, oh, can you come back or something like that? And you go, why don't y'all form a group and critique, you know? You can get back around some other, at some point in time, but they can self-critique. If you can teach people to self-critique themselves, they form groups. There's a great one down in Macon, Georgia, that they do a super job. And there's one in Atlanta now. So they're all, you know, that's an encouraging thing to get people to do. You know, that's what the Plein Air Convention is all about. It's about bringing community together. People, uh, somebody told me they met several other people from their own town that they didn't know existed. They had this common interest. Now they're going painting together. I, th I think this whole sense of community is really important for artists, especially from a growth standpoint. Yeah, I think, uh, and that, that really is fun. I, we were at the convention and I know we were sitting out there and there was, uh, I looked around at our table, there was 35 people, 35 artists just sitting there talking about art. And uh, I don't know, some of them I'd never met before. And it became really intriguing. I don't know, it's a great group of people in it, you know. Most of them are so much fun, it's, and most of them are so giving. Like if you can usually, I've noticed this, uh, when we're going around helping people, uh, doing those, uh, when the paint outs. Field painters. When yeah, you're... yeah, you get all these emails back from these people that go, hey, I really appreciate you stopping by and helping me do that. Well, that's great. So it, it is, it's a, I think it's a great thing. So I don't, you know, for me, <laughs> I, there, there's something I'll confess. I, five hours in the studio can wear me out, so I have I have to figure out ways to actually make it exciting for me. Right. And so I take a lot of breaks, and uh, I'll I now I've learned that it's the nuances that I've got to pursue. How much? And if you think about it like this, this isn't for just one painting. If I can learn to shift the nuance here, it applies to every every other painting from that point yeah. forward. So it has a big effect, and I think you, if you think about things like that, and see, I'm not a big buyer into the 10,000 hour thing. For me, 10,000 bad hours is not getting you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the Seahawks thing now. That coach is going, you know, you have your interest up, 
but we pract they practice deliberately. Right. I'm going to fix, the, I'm going to work on this. So if you go in and it's something you go, I want to really work on light and shade. Bingo. Stay with that for the whole day. Right. So make it, make it fun or you'll quit. The, going back to the workout routine, the best workout advice I got was from this guy 20 years ago. He said, he goes, I knew that if it was too hard, oh, this is a very good point. If I knew that if it was too hard, I would never keep it up. So he goes, I ran 10 minutes out <laughs> and I knew I had to run 10 minutes back. He's, I've been doing that for 10 years now. He goes, it works. So one thing I've learned, if you're stressing yourself too much, it's just stress. You can't cover that much ground and learn that much that fast. If you're not pushing yourself enough, you're in boredom. So there's a happy medium in there. So um, that guy actually got me to stay on my workout routine. And so I may increase it. I mean, I, don't, I do a lot more now because I've gotten older and I need to. But I, I did this one time. I said, well, you know, I'm going to get, I'm going to really work on my stomach and get that in. And I started doing all those things. I did them for three days in a row and I quit. And I said, see, that's not the way it goes. Right. You can't kill yourself. Right. So if you're painting, recognize that it's those little steps that are going to get you there and don't try to, I mean, if you don't, you don't go, you don't turn that big ship right away. Well, thank you for this. This a lot of really great insights today. Well, I appreciate it. It's great to be here and uh, I mean, it was very easy. You made it easy. Well, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs>
within the composition to make light glow. Now, Bill will show you his techniques and how you can produce your own stunning landscape paintings. You'll discover how to make light appear to glow, what you need to know to create harmony, great ways to draw the eye and create a focal point, the number one thing you need to know to create truly wonderful paintings, plus a whole lot more. As well as being a fantastic painter, Bill is also an incredible teacher of painting. He's taught more than 100 workshops. And now, in this exclusive video release, you get the benefit from all his teaching experience. How to Paint Glowing Landscapes with Bill Davidson is available now on DVD and streaming video.